Hi, I'm Ann Schell, Administration Liaison to the Board. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation. We are a religious community who commit ourselves to diversity. We hope to nourish human difference, those of gender, race, age, ability, sexual orientation, political views, culture, class, and religious belief. Welcome to all who treasure freedom of conscience in the search for truth. We promise to do our best to provide you a spiritual home. We extend a special welcome to our visitors today. We hope you will follow our UUC Facebook page and stay tuned for other events such as our Wonderful Wednesdays, Sunday Morning Religious Exploration for Children and Youth, and Sunday Morning Meditation. We are so excited to have you join us this morning. Our opening words this morning are from Sophia Lyon Foz. We gather in reverence before the wonder of life, the wonder of this moment, the wonder of being together so close yet so apart, each hidden in our own secret chamber, each listening and each trying to speak, yet none fully understanding, none fully understood. We gather in reverence before all intangible things that eyes see not nor ears can detect, that hands can never touch and space cannot hold and time cannot measure. Come, let us worship together. Gathered here in the mystery of the hour, This morning I have a few announcements that I would like to share um, from our events that are coming up soon and wanted to give you the opportunity to participate. On Sunday, August 23rd, we will have our second anti-racism discussion on Zoom and it is based around the book, So You Want to Talk About Race. You don't have to have read the book but you're welcome to read it or just join in. We're gonna have a discussion on Sunday, August 23rd at 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. And those links will be shared in our UU connections. Also on Monday, August 24th, here at UUC, uh, myself and some youth from our UUC youth group will be uh, picking up uh, supplies from folks. You can drive by and uh, we'll be outside from 1 to 3 p.m. on Monday, August 24th, and we'll be masked up and distanced, and um, it's a curbside drop-off of school supplies for the um, Eau Claire District, School District uh, Homeless Program. And we heard about that from Danny Klaskis uh, a couple Sundays ago, and so this is an important topic, and um, something that we care about at UUC, and I hope you can drop by some supplies, or if you have a middle school or high school youth that would like to participate, please contact me. And lastly, I just wanna share, we're having a membership class on Monday, August 24th via Zoom, and I will put information 
in the chat about that. And if you are new to UUC and want to learn more about um, our beliefs and what we do, or if you're interested in membership, you can also join that class. Thank you so much. We light our chalice with these words this morning. May the light of this chalice give light and warmth to our community when we are joyful and when we despair, and when we feel the warmth spread from our circle to wider and wider circles until all know they belong to the circle of life. This morning, we are interviewing Anna Semenko, who is one of our newest members, and um, we wanted to welcome her. Welcome! <laughs> and um, so, Anna, what brought you to this point in your life, kind of on your spiritual journey to be a part of the Unitarian Universalist congregation? Um, I was raised in a Catholic household, um, and as a teenager, I kind of felt that stop resonating with me. Mm -hmm. um, but I've always liked the idea um, of the community that a church provides. Um, and so I had seen that one of my friends post about UU on Facebook, and it prompted me to look into it. And um, just the principles kind of really resonated with the values that I was looking for in a community. And I just never knew it existed. So I'm just excited to learn more about it and be part of the community. Nice, nice. I was wondering, um, what sort of um, wisdom do you think you would share with others about you know where you are right now as far as um how you've come along in your life i would say always stay true to yourself regardless of what others are saying around you but also still continue to listen to those other voices and be open okay and one um, sneaky surprise question. What's, what's something that um, we wouldn't know about you that, uh, that uh, you could tell us about? Um, I'm the youngest of nine children. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Did, did you grow up locally or kind of? Yep, I grew up in Eau Claire. Nice, nice, Eau Claire yeah. native. Well, thank you, Anna, for being on the Eau Claire Spotlight. Any parting words that you want to share about? No, I'm just excited to meet everyone, I guess. <laughs> well, thank you so much. All right. Thank you. The Gold Coin, a retelling of an old story, author unknown. A wise old man had one precious possession a gold coin. For years, he looked at the coin every day, turning it over and over in his fingers. One day, he realized that others might need the coin more than he did. Looking out of his window, he saw a girl in a tattered dress passing by. He went outside and gave her the coin. The child was speechless. She knew that her mother could use the coin and gave it to her when she arrived home. Her mother was overjoyed. The coin was an answer to so many problems. She wondered what she should buy first. Her thoughts were interrupted by a knock at the door. It was a beggar in ragged clothes and obviously starving. While she was struggling to get by, the beggar was far worse off. She took the coin out of her apron pocket and gave it to him. The beggar could not believe his good luck. This coin meant decent clothes and food for many months. He was almost in tears as he thanked the woman. He headed back to the place where he lived. It was under a bridge where other homeless people slept. Walking along the path, he came to a woman who was blind and disabled. She was sitting on the ground with her crutches beside her. Her head was bowed as she held out her hand in silence. 
the beggar realized that she was far worse off than he was. At least he could walk through the town and beg at one house after another. Looking down, he knew that she needed the coin far more than he did. Without saying a word, he placed the coin in the old woman's hand. She held the coin tightly, but had no idea of its value. Toward evening, the wise old man walked down the path to take a stroll along the river. He saw the blind woman and said, I know that you must be in great need, but I have nothing to give you but my friendship. Tears began to roll down the woman's cheeks. No one ever spoke to her. She reached into her coat pocket, took out the coin, and said, I don't have much, but please take this coin for your incredible kindness. Now is the time in our service for joys and concerns. We celebrate our community of care by sharing with one another our deepest joys and concerns. If you, I would like to light this candle for Jesse Hoy Peterson's mother-in-law. We sent her light and support during this time. I would also like to light a candle for all the students and teachers and staff and families and everyone being impacted by choices that they're making for this coming school year. Compassion to everyone as they consider what is best for their own families and how it impacts themselves and, and their community. I'm going to leave a period of silence as you share your joys and concerns in this sacred space. Light this final candle for all the joys and concerns too tender to escape the folds of our hearts. And if you'll join with these words for closing our joys and concerns. Love is the spirit of this church and service its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. We give thanks for the gifts given today, our caring for each other and our material goods. May this offering be a blessing to friends and strangers, neighbors all. Each Sunday we give half of all non-pledge donations to nonprofit organizations that work to help others. You may give a check and make it out to UUC. You can drop that in the mail or drop it by the congregation. There's a mailbox by our door. It's also possible to donate online at uueauclair.com or even to text to give at 84321. With gratitude for the abundance in our lives, we give to help people in need and to support the work of this congregation. The offering will now be given and gratefully received.
these are words of an Ojibwe woman from Green Bay, Wisconsin. Ashki Memengwa, or New Butterfly. Sadly, the United States is and always has been addicted to denial of our racist past and the need for earth healing and stewardship. The vast majority of Americans simply want to get on with life, believe that all is in the past, imagine that it is over, pretend human power is greater than nature's power, argue that they didn't do it, justify that they are therefore not responsible. Amends are needed. There has and continues to be an inherited loss for many people. Healing is necessary. Our Mother Earth needs Ogichida, brave warriors, to heal and protect her. The children need a new Earth. The children need a new world. The healing is both complicated and simple. Going to the moon was complicated. Raising a family is complicated. Creating a symphony can be a complicated process. But the power behind each endeavor, each goal is simple. Behind each success is love and creative power. Each person is born with the creative ability to offer healing to our world. Wherever we live, whomever we encounter. So speak up, acknowledge, correct the wrongs, protect the earth, honor the children. This is Uben Ubenuchi Uki. This is the children's land. We have a responsibility to look at the reality of what we have inherited. Where does history begin and the consequences of being born end? What is inheritance? What are you entitled to? And where do you draw the line? And is there a line? Where does your responsibility begin and your consciousness end? It is time to come together as one people, to offer strength to one another, to share in the bounty of the creator. It is time to heal both the inherited victims and the inherited perpetrators need to heal. Our mother earth needs to heal. Hi, I'm Eric Magyar, and, and today I will be speaking a little bit about the Anishinaabe worldview and way of life. Uh, this will be mostly about the traditional way of life, which is the way it used to be, and which, of course, now, um, post-1980 or so, uh, many of the Anishinaabe, the younger ones, are trying to get back to, uh, to trying to restore some of the values. Uh, they can't do all of it, obviously. They're not going to be living in bark houses or something. Uh, but a lot of the traditions that were there, which were uh, very strongly ingrained in their way of life, they would like to bring back again. And uh, they need a lot of help in this regard. Uh, Lawrence Gross, one of the uh, predominant, uh, or it's, I'm sorry, it's Anton Troyer, uh, a predominant Anishinaabe writer, has said that uh, uh, ethnographers and anthropologists expect that by the middle of this century, possibly no more than four or five of the once 500 Native American languages in this country will survive. Uh, in fact, almost every day there's the last surviving speaker of a particular language is leaving us. 
Uh, Anishinaabe will probably be ones that survive because there's about 20,000 speakers of it right now, a lot of them in Canada. Uh, our world sorely needs some sort of spiritual direction. And I think we can get it from folks like these. Bonjour, Rick Nindajinikas, Chippewa Falls, Nindunjiba, Gawin Nindodabasi, Oma Akin Nindaya, Manidog Wabanon, Manidog Jawanon, Manidog Nindavianon, Manidog Gwedenon, Manidog Ishpeming, Manidog Oma Akin, Ninoa, Manidog Miziwe, Nigwech, Nino Bamadaziyan. Ninoa Gimama Akimanan, Gimigwech Mindan. Dagoi Dukawashig, Jimatawe, the Boyan, Miguech, Joan Mihan. Briefly, what that was is the way an, an Ojibwe person would introduce themselves. What I said was, My name is Rick. I live in Chippewa Falls. I don't belong to any clan, obviously, since I'm not Ojibwe. Uh, and then I appeal to the spirits of the East, the South, the West, and the North, in that order, and then up above and down below. And in case I missed any, the spirits everywhere else. And I ask them, I thank them first for my health and for my Mother Earth. And then I ask that I might speak the truth, and then I ask them to bless me. So that's it. Uh, before I get into this, I'd like to say a word or two about uh, Anishinaabe and Ojibwe and Chippewa and Ojibwa. And there seems to be some confusion going on. Okay, so originally the Ojibwe, or the Anishinaabe, I should say, were a group of people who lived in the northeastern coast of the United States near the mouth of the St. Lawrence River up in present Newfoundland. And about 600 years ago, they received a prophecy that said they better start moving west because there's going to be an onslaught of, of light-skinned people from the east sometime in the future. This was about 100 years before Columbus. And so they started up the St. Lawrence River, stopping first at uh, Montreal and Quebec for about 100 years or so. And then they moved on to Boating, which is present to St. Marie. And there they split into three groups, the Potawatomi, or Keepers of the Fire, the uh, Ottawa, who meet with the traders, and the Ojibwe, the Keepers of the Faith. And they stayed in Boating for about 150 years. And then they further moved west until they got to Moaning Wanapani, the place of the yellow-breasted woodpecker, which is today known as Madeline Island. And they lived there for about 150 years. And then after a while, they decided to move onto shore and they uh, populated the upper peninsula of Michigan, northern Wisconsin, northern Minnesota, and a little further west. You can see from this diagram here, uh, their path that they roughly followed coming from the northeast of North America and it shows what they call now the southeastern Ojibwe, the northern Ojibwe, the plains Ojibwe, and the southwestern Ojibwe, which are listed as Chippewa. Chippewa is a name that was given to them by uh, the Americans. It's not one that they themselves gave themselves, and so they generally don't use it too much uh, when referring to themselves. They uh, prefer Ojibwe, and in the last 10 to 15 years, many of them have started going back to the original name, the Anishinaabe, or sometimes as they call themselves, Shinabs, same as they call us Chimooks, which is short for Gitchimukuman, or the Long Knives. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Anishinaabe worldview and the way, the way of life. First off, of course, I should let you know how I got into this in the first place. A few years ago, uh, I decided to take a course uh, in Ojibwe Moen, which is the Ojibwe language, or Anishinaabe Moen, at UW-Eau Claire. Concurrent with this class is a 
once a week session on Ojibwe culture. And during that class, that one credit that was added on to the language class, I learned stuff about Native Americans that I just completely was unaware of for all my years of education. Besides all the history book stuff that we get, you know, about the Battle of the Little Big Horn and Wounded Knee Massacre, and it was the Dawes Act, or the Allotment Act of 1887, that resulted in fully two-thirds of all the Native reservation land in the U.S. was taken away by the U.S. government and sold to white settlers, which is why you find so much uh, of the boundaries of uh, preservation listed on the map, and yet when you get there, you find out that two-thirds of the land is owned by white people. Then there was the boarding schools, which operated for about a hundred years. I never knew about this until 1973, where Indian children were taken forcibly sometimes from their homes and carted off to boarding schools. Uh, it could be hundreds of miles away, the further the better where they were indoctrinated with the glories of white civilization while constantly being told how stupid and backward their own cultures were. They were punished severely for speaking their own language. They were sexually and physically abused. Over 100,000 children were subjected to this treatment, which was designed to, quote, kill the Indian to save the man. Forced assimilation was the official policy of our government. Add to that the realization that according to the book 1491, the latest estimate by anthropologists and ethnographers is that there were about 20 million inhabitants of the North American continent the year before Columbus arrived. And that in the US census of the year 2000, or 1900, excuse me, there were 200,000 Native Americans remaining. Do the math. That's a reduction of 99% over 400 years. It was not until 2008 that a resolution was introduced into the United States Senate to at least apologize to the Native Americans. Of course, it took five years of struggle in Congress until it was finally passed. And in 2009, President Barack Obama signed an official apology. No recognition of the boarding school tragedy. Uh, the Canadian government has, has done so. They went from 2008 till 2015. They had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And they, uh, as I said, just ended that um, and I think we could really use that in this country. The devastating effect that colonization has had on the Anishinaabeg people has left many of them reeling in what Lawrence Gross, an Anishinaabe writer, has called post-apocalypse stress syndrome, or PASS. He says PASS is like PTSD on steroids because it attempted to destroy an entire culture. Historians note that when such a devastating uh, attempt at destroying a culture has been done in the past, it has taken between 100 and 150 years for the culture to recover, if it recovers at all. Yet there is hope, a prophecy that had circulated in this country, in Indian country, in the middle of the last century, said that the people would search out, the Anishinaabe people, would search out their elders and traditional teachers again when the eagle flew to the highest place. And on July 20th, 1969, everybody on earth watched on television when the Apollo 11 landed on the moon and the men transmitted the message back to earth the eagle has landed. Indeed, efforts to revitalize the language and culture of the Anishinaabe have been underway for about 25 years. 
like wadukadating, which means we help each other. It's a language immersion school at LCO, the Hudere up in Hayward. And there's a few other places, Minnesota has one or two. Which brings me back again to Ojibwe men, Ojibwe men or Anishinaabe men. One of the first things I noticed about this language was that the language was totally unlike any of the European languages with which I was familiar. This is largely because the structure of the language is predicated on a particular worldview. For example, Anishinaabe Mawin, like most indigenous languages, is comprised of approximately 80% verbs and 20% nouns, while most modern European languages are just the opposite, consisting of about 80% nouns and only 20% verbs. What this means for us in the latter core category is that since nouns are used to name things or objects, that we generally see the world as a collection of objects intended to be used for our own purpose, ostensibly for our own good. Whereas for the Anishinaabe, whose language is mostly verbs denoting action or motion or relationships between people, the universe is alive and is generally seen as a communion of subjects each of whom have a shared responsibility for its survival. For example, there's no word for rain. You can only say gimelin, it is raining, or gigimelin, it rained, or we gimelin, it will rain, or Sunday, anama egizikit, it is praying day, or my favorite, Saturday, gazibi gasaganagegizike, which means it is floor scrubbing day. When you translate from French to Italian or German or French, uh, it's merely a matter of finding the correct word to describe familiar concepts. But to translate to Anishinaabe Moen, <laughs> it's a totally different experience. It's because they don't see the world the same way as we do. It's a kind of vision I suspect that we once had a few millennia ago, but which we have almost lost because of our narrowly intense focus on the methods of scientific deductionism, which is breaking everything down logically into its smallest parts in order to help us understand the whole. The Anishinaabeg, on the other hand, tend to look at the whole first and try to understand how each part contributes to its harmonious operation. As such, they are primarily religious people. In fact, they perceive themselves as spirits, having a human experience. They are constantly aware of living in two worlds, physical and spiritual, simultaneously. To check this development, consider when a child becomes aware of this, this wiggly thing here, its hand for the first time. It's just in awe and wonder. And then it discovers that this thing is attached to itself somehow. Wow, this is really cool. And for the Anishinaabe child, it goes a step further. When it perceives the world around itself, it thinks that it's too must be connected to itself somehow by some which appears visible by some inner eye only. After all, we're taught that we're all related. And so the child is instructed throughout its life. Its goal is to figure out just how it fits in to the whole rest of creation and what role it must play. And so it learns about Nokomis Gizik, Grandmother Cedar, and Mishumas Birch, Grandfather Birch. Additional knowledge, or Gikandasawan, is learned from observing the behavior of its parents and other members of the community. Also, there are the most important teachings of the Atosukanik, or sacred stories, of the elders, 
formerly shared only on winter evenings, though in recent years, many of them have been written down in, helps, in hopes of uh, preserving them for future generations. Still, the full depth of meaning contained in these stories can only be fully appreciated and understood by fluent speakers of Anishinaabe mind. How else might you realize, for example, that bear, box, the color black, and fasting for a vision were somehow connected? Bear is makwa, box is makak, black is makadewa, and vision fasting is makadake. They all start with muck. How are they connected? A bear hibernates in a small place like a box, which is very dark, and fasts for a long time, which is how these words get connected. And you have such connections between other sets of words as well, which again, you're only going to appreciate if you understand the language. The Anishinaabe considered the Atazupanik these sacred stories to be alive, not in the sense of a cat or dog or some other animal, but because they had the ability to work co-creatively with the listeners to inspire them and help them shape the world. In this way, they can transform it. According to the Anishinaabeg, the ability to transform oneself or others is one of the dominant characteristics of personhood. And so for this reason, they regard animals, trees, the thunder beings, the sun and moon, and sometimes even stones as non-human persons because they can, can transform themselves or they can assist in transforming other persons. Stones in a sweat lodge, you pour water, on the hot stones and it creates steam, the steam, which then uh, cleanses you and helps change you, bring visions. To the Anishinaabe, these fellow persons have the same rights and responsibilities as do we. And they are therefore to be treated with great respect. This is not simply some superficial environmental ethic. <laughs> It is ingrained in their entire way of living. The primary lessons the Atazupanik strive to teach, of course, are about the modest way, or the good life, and how to obtain and maintain it. On the surface, of course, this means living in harmony with your fellow persons, with the natural world, both humans and non-humans, and having meaningful family relationships, good health, longevity, but of course, this external appearance of the modest win is based entirely on a deeply maintained internal balance between mind, heart, body, and spirit. Or to put it another way, between your thoughts, your emotions, your bodily feelings, and your spiritual intuitions. This is shown here on the medicine wheel, where each of these four aspects of the self is also granted a color and a direction. You can see here white, Vavishka, is for the mental, the mind. Uh, east, Mesqua, red, is for the spiritual. Physical is the south, Ozawa, yellow. And Makadewa, black for the emotions. And then of course, if I plug this thing in here, little stick, we have a three-dimensional wheel where it's blue heading up to the sky and green uh, going to the earth. Incidentally, these are the only five colors that are formally recognized in Anishinaabe. Uh, for example, if you wanted to say something was pink, you'd have to say begin to one day, which is, it is the color of bubble gum. Or if you wanted to say something is dark bluish purple, you would say minande. It is the color of a blueberry. So 
it's the way you get the other colors. Uh, to the extent that the four aspects of the self, body, mind, heart, and spirit, are kept in the proper balance, you can expect to experience the when in your daily life. In fact, many of the Adazubinic and sacred stories relate tales of how Wenabojo, their culture hero, or some other character temporarily gets one of these four uh, more dominance than the others, and the consequences that follow until the balance is again restored. New Gijikuikwe was a woman of four skies from Odawazagaigening, which is the Kudere Reservation up near uh, uh, Hayward, has written of the medicine wheel. I was told if you were tired and weak, go to a straight, tall tree. Put your arms around and hug it real hard. I did just that. Suddenly I felt the tree take me fast down to the bottom of its roots, deep into Mother Earth where I felt the strength, safety, darkness, and depth. And just as fast as it took me down to the deep into earth, it took me up to Father Sky, where I saw his strong arms reaching outward and upward toward, bur toward purity, beauty, and infinity. Instantly, I remembered something that an elder had told me. When you can see the direct line from Mother Earth to Father Sky, you will know the sacred meaning of life. This goal of keeping the four aspects of the self in balance obviously cannot be achieved without the effective help and cooperation of both human and other than human persons, as well as by your own personal efforts. This is why all Anishinaabe boys, especially, aspire to undergo the puberty fast, Makakdewum, or vision quest. This was the means by which it was possible to establish a direct social interaction with persons of the other than human class. And also to acquire for the first time a spirit helper such spirit helpers are not mythical, they're real. Because for the Anishinaabe, everything that is perceived by the senses, everything we think, everything we envision, imagine, conceive, dream, and intuit, they're all inseparable aspects of his reality. And they're all vital parts of his life. The psychologist C.G. Jung has observed that in the history of the human race, we in present day Western civilization are now unique in our disbelief in spirits and the value of dreams. Indeed, if a boy received blessings during his puberty fast, and as a man he could call upon the help of other than human persons when he needed them, he was well prepared for the vicissitudes of life. I could say much more, but time limits us. I'd like to close with something written by a graduate student, Karen Delario at Lakehood University in Thunder Bay. This is a little long, but it tends to describe, you'll see. I was planning the making of two bags of brain tanned leather, which were to be very special gifts for some friends of I wanted them to include several items, of which one would be cedar bark. I took tobacco and went to the woods where I live where there are cedar trees. I went from one tree to another, put down some tobacco and said thank you, took some bark and went back to the house. Something did not feel right. I was very uncomfortable. What, had, what I had done did not seem in keeping with the gifts nor was there a response to them. I thought, I thought it over that night. It seemed to me one tree in particular was appropriate for the gifts. And the next day I went back to that tree. 
This day I took my time. My dogs were with me and they went off exploring on their own. I thought about that cedar tree and why it was appropriate for the gifts, why I wanted to include its bark. I thought what the gifts meant as symbols of the qualities I wanted to give to my nieces for whom the gifts were intended. The daily sounds of the woods receded and suddenly there was the squeaky sound of a pileated woodpecker's wings as he flew close to me. He landed on a nearby tree and drilled for a few moments. Then he left. Next came the burst of busy rustling and flapping as a grouse flew up to a branch in front of me, where she perched for a few minutes and then left. Then there was an insistent dry rustling noise behind me until I finally turned around. A white-breasted nuthatch was vigorously scrabbling through the curlings of bark on a birch tree. I sensed it was now the time to give the tobacco to the tree. I then took the bark I needed, and the dogs and I returned home, along with the common sounds of the woods. This day I knew I had acted correctly. Each bird had given something of itself to the gifts. Although I hadn't presumed to ask, I had thought what the gifts were for and who they were for. The world ordered itself around me and interacted with me differently than it had the day before when I thought and therefore acted in a different way. This experience illustrates what I call the transformative process, a combination of experience and reflection. I think with this understanding, we can move beyond the Western definition of mystical experience and realize that there is another state of awareness called spiritual by the Anishinaabe in which one can function. And this mind state is accessible to non-Anishinaabe people as well through the transformative process as I have demonstrated. Thank you. Misa'i. Now is a time in our service where we extinguish our chalice. We extinguish our flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. <laughs> 